So, um, I was wondering, what's the difference between a segula and an inyan, and um, how important are they in somebody's avodas Hashem? Well, you know, there are different opinions. You know, uh, segula is kind of doing something that is supposed to elicit a special spiritual benefit. Now, there are two types of skulas. There is a skula that directly connects to Avodah Hashem. So one might say a skula might be to daven at the Kaisel for 40 days. So you're marba and fila. A skula is to give staka before Megillah reading. Those skulas are absolutely perfectly fine because essentially what you're doing is you're doing certain mitzvahs that are said to elicit gates of rachamim. So a segula that is makushar to a strengthening of Avaita Hashem is absolutely a good thing. Uh, now, there are other types of skulas which are kind of resemble magic tricks. You know, you wear a red string around uh, yourself when you, that's been encircled, or whatever, different things, or you drink a certain water, etc. Now, those segulas are very, very controversial. There are going to be some great tzaddikim that say these are just superstitions, and not only don't they work, and not only are they foolish, you shouldn't even, you're not allowed to do them because they're superstitious. Others base it on Kabbalah, that, that certain things may have a koach, but I think the uh, Litvish tradition, so to speak, of which you are proudly a part, kind of the tradition of the great yeshivos and the great Russian yeshivos, was not to pay a lot of attention to schoolists. Now, Sephardim are, li are a little more attuned to it. But one thing is for sure, they should not be a major part of your Vedas Hashem. If you believe in it, you hold of it, so let it be something that augments. Under no circumstances should it be an excuse. Uh, I'm going to go to Skula instead of. You know, uh, somebody once asked the Sfas Emes. You know, in the Hasidic world, Skulas are also sometimes regarded. It says, what's the best Skula? for a certain thing. So the Svas Emes says, the best segula is the Pasuk, Vahiyisim li segula mikala amim. Now, what that means is this. By Matan Torah, Hashem said, you will be for me a precious treasure by the way you live your life. The best segula is to be a segula in Hashem's eyes. Or they tell a story about the Brisker Rav, that the Brisker Rav was not a great fan of Hasidus generally. Brisker's derech was not Hasidus. It isn't Hasidus. But there was a certain Hasidic Sharav that the Briskarav very much admired. So his Talmidim once asked him, why are you so close to this Hasidic Rebbe? He says, oh, I love this Rebbe. Because people come to him and they say, I need a schooler for Parnasa." So the Rebbe said, oh, learn Maseches Bava Metziah, that all, all the laws of business. He says, I need a schooler for a Shidduch. He says, oh, Maseches Kedushin with all the Taisis. Now, this Rebbe didn't have a lot of Hasidim because people want a shortcut. I want a skula like, you know, jump up and down five times before breakfast and the gates of heaven will open. But a skula that says, I got to learn a Masechus, <laughs> I'd rather not have that type of Rebbe. Uh, but the Brisker Rebbe said, but that's the Hasidic Rebbe I like, he said, the one that goes that way. So, particularly in Eretz Israel a little bit, we become a little bit obsessed. It's kind of in the air for various reasons with skulas. I don't want to call it gimmicks, although I actually feel it is, but okay, but I don't want, again, I don't want to get my hate mail on this. Uh, but we've made the tafel an iker, and we sometimes make the iker a tafel. So it's important not to get caught up in the school of fever that sometimes uh, passes around. Yeah? Um, I've heard an idea that there's a halacha that uh, for a Tomatopin's wife, he would also stand up just like he's doing for I've asked a few people, and they, not many people seem to know about this block, and I was wondering, is it something that we do today? I saw it's brought down in Taz, but not really. Yeah, many yeah, yeah, yeah. So this is based on a phrase in the Gemara. Uh, the Gemara has a law shown, Eishes Chaver, the wife of a uh, Talmud Chacham, Kechaver, is like a Talmud Chacham. Now, the Gemara doesn't spell it out exactly what does that mean, but some say that the same honor that you would give to a Talmud Chacham, you're supposed to give to the wife of a Talmud Chacham as well. Uh, you are correct that it's commonly not done today. Uh, the basis for that is simply this, that even a Talmud Chacham could be mochel on kavod, standing up for him, etc. Uh, and therefore, the assumption is that most women don't want to be, I mean, again, sunias means they don't want their presence to be noticed, so to speak. So in a sense, if the whole world, let's imagine an Eishas Chavar comes in and the whole yeshiva stands up, 
for an Eishas Chaver, in some way she wouldn't want that, right? Because that's a violation of Tznias. So because of that, the assumption is that there's a mechila on the standing up. But the overall principle is still there, that in Eishas Chaver, you must treat with, you know, Kavod and Derech Eretz, of course, every Jew you treat that way, but Eishas Chaver even more so, especially since in many, many cases, if not most cases, we apply to the wife what Rabbi Akiva said about his wife. Do you remember the situation? Of course, that was a little extreme. She let him go to learn Torah for 12 years, and after 12 years, she let him go back for another 12 years. And when he, he started off first grade with the, with the kids who were learning how to read, and after 24 years, he was the great Gadol, Rabbi Akiva, who came back with 24,000 students. And his wife had lived in poverty for all of those years. And when she came near him, the students thought she was a cra crazy woman, like a beggar woman. And she was pushed away. And Rabbi Akiva said, Shali v'shalachem, all that I am and all that you are is only because of her. Now, that was an extreme case of devotion, but the truth is, for most Talmidei uh, Chachamim, there is a Bechina that what they became, or what they are, is in a large degree because of, of their wives. So, for, for sure, a nation's chaver deserves a lot of covet, but the minig is not to stand up because that would be drawing attention. So we assume there's mechila on that. Yeah. Um, I'm wondering, for, for time differences, like Israel versus LA, What's the best way post our Sha uh, Shabbos or post our Yom Tov to tell someone in LA who know is Jewish like we're alive? Um, I know we can't just call them or text them, but can we, for example, call a non-Jew, tell them, and they happen to voice it? Or yeah. So that, yeah. So that's a ve that's a very very interesting question. Uh, the issue of of time zones, and and halacha, and you are correct. The first thing you said is absolutely correct. And that is when Shabbos is over for me. I'm not allowed to directly call a Jew in a time zone that's still Shabbos for them, simply because I would be causing them to do an Avera. It's not a sin for me. It's not a sin for me to place the call, but the sin is I'm causing a Jew to desecrate Shabbos in his place of location. So you are correct. You cannot uh, just call your parents uh, when Shabbos is over here, if it's still Shabbos in the States, whether East Coast or, or West Coast. Uh, now, the question is this. Um, are you allowed to call a guy? Now, this is very, very interesting. Normally, uh, you're not allowed to tell a guy to do malacha on Shabbos either, right? So the same way, it's not as chomer, but the same way I don't cause a Jew to do malacha, I'm not supposed to cause a guy to do malacha, right? That's the issue of Amir Eliakim. So the question is, how does that apply if it's Shabbos for the guy or in the time zone of the guy? So interestingly enough, there seems to be a, a differentiation here, and that is the Easter of telling a goy to do malacha is only when it's Shabbos for you. So as long as it's Shabbos for me, I can't tell a goy to do malacha. Once it's not Shabbos for me, even though it's Shabbos for him, remember, the goy doesn't have a mitzvah of Shabbos. The only prohibition is on me telling him, so that's going to be based on my time zone. You see the difference? Therefore, number one, I am allowed, when Shabbos is over here, to place a call to a non-Jew, generally on Shabbos. And there's nothing wrong, therefore, with my telling the non-Jew to tell my parents, hopefully not by calling them. <laughs> Again, you, otherwise you're just doing the same thing. But uh, let's say they're next door neighbor or something. Uh, I to tell my parents that I'm OK, you see? Because uh, unlike my achrayas, when there's a Jew, I can't cause a Jew to desecrate Shabbos. But by a guy, the guy is not desecrating Shabbos. There's an iser on me to tell a guy to do malacha. So that's totally on the fact that it's Shabbos for me. When it's not Shabbos for me, that iser of Amir and Liakam is not going to apply. Now, I just want to say that what I just told you is in fact a machlokas. I, I'm telling you what the halacha is. In fact, some poskim would in fact be machmer on that situation as well. Um, yeah. Yeah, so uh, this is Meiser money, right? Meiser money is the obligation. So Machlokas is it Doraisa, Drabanan, or Minog. There are three different shitos that uh, a Jew that is able to afford it, if you're, if you're not living in the red, uh, you use 10% of your earnings, of your salaries, or your gifts even, 
and you give it for various tzedakah. And uh, the issue always becomes, what can I use the maser money for? What is the legitimate maser money cost? So you're talking about using the maser for family. Like, right. family. Like you, when, when so, 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 so here's the point. L'chatchila, maser should go to people who are called poor. Now, the question then becomes, what's the definition of poor? Now, poor does not just mean they're homeless or they're living on bread and water. You know, those are obviously poor people. But poor people can basically mean people who, do not afford, who cannot afford the normal types of things that middle class people generally have in their society. Uh, so if somebody could not afford medical bills, if they, had, uh, they needed dental care, or they needed psychiatric care, which is expensive, even if they're living a middle class life, but if they wouldn't be able to have that medical care, you can give Meiser for them. Uh, some might even say something like if they couldn't send their kids to summer camp. Again, that's an interesting machlokas, but that's considered to be important enough. So the basic issue is like this. You know, if, if your cousin tells you, I feel so bad, you know, business is tight, I just can't get to Switzerland this year. Well, you know, you don't give Meiser money so somebody could take a trip to Switzerland or even to Aspen, Colorado. So it's not always an easy answer, but you, know, you kind of have to ask yourself, is something like a reasonable, normal type of middle class thing, or is it like a luxury? You don't use Meister for luxuries, but you use Meister for legitimate needs. Can I just yeah. follow up on that? I was talking to Rock a little while ago, and he said like, someone that has a, has a realized the importance of like, wearing Hajj Katan, um, like, that's considered poor. So in, in some senses, you could use like, massive money to buy them a Hajj Katan. Okay, so that's a slightly different nuance. So here we're dealing with Meiser money for Jewish outreach, for Kirov. Right. Meaning, yeah. meaning in, in your case, that's a little more of a different case. In your case, the guy could afford a Talas Katan, but he wouldn't get one except for you. Okay. Yeah. So uh, once see, the best way of giving Meiser is you actually give one-fifth if you can afford it. So there's a 10% and then another 10%. So on the second 10%, there is absolutely no question you can use it for all of those in Yanim. No question at all. Can you use the first 10% for outreach projects and Kirov Rechokim? That would be a little bit of a machlokas unless there's an income problem there. So for example, I'll give you an example where you could use it. Let's say uh, the guy has kids and he's not going to send them to a Jewish day school because it's too expensive you would be able to use your maestro to pay his tuition because, because that's a financial difficulty. Talis Katim is not a financial difficulty, it's simply he wouldn't do it. So that's a Kirov project. So there is a machlokas, but uh, if, you, if you could not afford the Talis Katim unless you do his maestro, uh, in other words, you would be allowed to use it to help him do his mitzvah. Wait, if I, sorry, could you say one more time? No, I, I just said like oh. this, I said that it is not the preferred use of your miser, unless it's the second 10%. But if you wouldn't be able to do it unless you used your miser, mm -hmm. then better to do it and use miser than not to do it. Meaning, the best thing for you to do is use your own money. But if that would be difficult for you, you could use miser for that purpose, you see? Yeah. In Judaism, we believe in specific divine providence that even a leaf blowing in the wind is divinely orchestrated is for the best, how does that, how can that coexist with the notion of free will and the um, outcomes of the choices I make with my free will? So for example, let's say someone gives me a test and all my answers um, are on a separate card and using the card with it. And I choose not to use the card and because I chose not to use the answer card, I failed on the test. How can me, that thing that happened to me, in other words, me failing on a test, be from Hashem and thus be from the good, for the good, when it's clearly coming from my own free will to not use the answer card. Right, right. So the question is a very, very difficult question, a very good question, and that is, on one hand, we believe in Hashgacha Pratis, uh, that God dictates and God determines every th single thing that will happen to me. Uh, and some say, some say even inanimate things, like leaves or whatever, but certainly what happens to me as a human, what me as a Jew, and yet we also know that Hashem gave human beings 
uh, free will, and free will has consequences. I make certain decisions, some things happen. I make other decisions, other things happen. So what is it? Are the things that happen to me from Hashem, in which it's Gamzul Tova, it's for the good, or are the things that happen to me products of my free will? Now, obviously, some things are just like the insurance policy says, clearly acts of God, right? If I'm sitting here and the building collapses, that's from Hashem for whatever the reason is. But a lot of things are consequences of decisions that I make, right? I go to a certain school, I, go, I, I get married to a certain person. Certain consequences are flowing. And the question is, is it from God or is it from the choices that I make in which I was free to make because, you know, I have Bechira and the like. So I'm going to answer the, I'm going to talk about the question in the way that you asked it because uh, I don't want to uh, argue with the people online about this. I know, and I've mentioned it before, that there is a huge machlokas if everything is Hashkacha Pratis. Many uh, understand the Rambam to say that only tzaddikim have Hashkacha Pratis and for most of us we're governed by, by the laws of nature unless Hashem chooses to intervene. That's the Rambam Shita. I'm not going to get into the Rambam Shita. There are many, many problems with that Shita, but there is such a Shita. But you're going with the Shita of the Mekubalim and the Derech Hashem and certainly all of the Talmidim of the Baal Shem Tov, that everything that happens to me is Hashgach pratis. So we're going with that Shita in terms of addressing the question. And the question then becomes, well, is it God or is it my free will? So one way of looking at it is this. Hashgacha pratis itself is not static, meaning everything that happens to me is because God decrees it. But God decrees things based on the decisions that I make. I mean, let's look at the Torah itself. The Torah itself says, if you keep the commandments, you will have good things happening to you. If you don't keep the commandments, you'll have bad things happening to you. So, if I don't keep the commandments and bad things happen to me, on one level, it was my decision. On the other level, God decreed what the consequences would be as a result of my decision. You see, people have your question only because you're assuming hashkacha is static, and then the question is, well, how can it change based on what I do? But hashkacha itself is not static. Hashkacha itself is interactive. Hashkacha itself will mold itself. God will make decisions based on how I act. And therefore, my actions do determine what will happen to me, but not because I'm in charge, but because God is going to respond to me the way I choose to go. Okay, so if you understand Hashgacha Pratis as an interactive process of Hashem and human choice, uh, then you can see that I can suffer negative consequences because of choices that I make, and I can, I can get positive consequences because of choices that I make. All of those consequences come from Hashem, but Hashem is interacting with the particulars of my will. Now, where you get into a more difficult problem is, well, what if you didn't make any bad choices, but somebody else did? Meaning, that's the old question of the robber who comes into the 7-Eleven, and uh, you happen to be there at 2 o'clock in the morning, uh, and God forbid somebody gets shot. Now, did the robber have the choice to pull the trigger or not pull the trigger? Surely. On the other hand, if he wouldn't have pulled the trigger, the guy wouldn't have died. But that means if he pulls the trigger and the guy dies, it wasn't God's decision for him to die because he wouldn't have died had the guy not pulled the trigger. So what's going on? So that's a huge, huge issue. The Orachayim actually takes the position that when God gave the thief, the burglar, Bechira, that could even override God's hashgacha pratis. Others say that that's impossible and the guy would have died anyway, so to speak. If the, if, if the robber wouldn't have pulled the trigger, the guy would have had a heart attack and would have fallen. So that, that's a big machlokas, meaning just to, cater, just to put it in a cubby hole. That shayla is to what degree can somebody else's bechira interfere with my hashgacha? So that's a, a subcategory. But... Does my Bechira influence my Hashkacha? Absolutely yes, because God himself will mold his Hashkacha to me based on my choices. So don't confuse the two questions. The Arachayim's problem is whether somebody else's Bechira can cut into my Hashkacha. 
And that's a very sharply debated issue. But my Bechira, 100% molds my Hashgacha. Yeah. Here's the sentence. Given that we would almost certainly not appear before important dignitaries without a tie, why do we daven without one? Is it subject to each individual's practice or general society's definition of such of attire? Yeah, it's, it's an interesting question. Uh, generally speaking, uh, in let's take the United States, because Israel might, might in fact be different. Uh, generally speaking, if you're going to uh, an important meeting, you wear a tie. You know, you don't show up unless it's casual Friday or whatever they have in, in, some, in some offices. And since the basic standard for tefillah is how, technically says, how would you stand before a king? But that's interpreted today not to mean a king, but, you know, if you were going to somebody important. And uh, people would wear ties, so why would we not wear a tie? So, so first of all, I guess, first of all, there are people who don't wear ties even in business meetings, uh, whether they're Hasidim or Bechlal in Eretz Israel, in Israel, Israeli society, even among secular, is less formal, or you work for Google or whatever it is, those guys uh, come in without, uh, you know, they don't have to dress any particular way. So this is going to be a halacha that will change with society as a whole. But I think the way it might work is this. Even if you subjectively are a person who would put on a tie, see, it doesn't automatically tie into you as an individual. If you live in a society where this is not something mandatory, generally, then you're not mechoyev in Hilchos Tefillah to wear it because it's not necessarily what people have to do. Um, although it is interesting, um, when Moshe Feinstein people pointed out, Davin Shmona Esrei ramrod straight. He literally was like paralyzed. He would bow down the four times, and then he was totally straight, which is very unusual because most you know, people move, and there's even a makor for shuckling. All of my limbs, kol asmosai, tomarna michamocha. It's a makor. Although it's fascinating, just a little, little uh, digression here for a moment. Uh, this is called in Yiddish, shuckling. Shuckling just means moving back and forth. There's a little mocker in the Gemara. It mentions Rabbi Akiva would daven with so much kavana. He would start off in one corner and wind up in another corner. That implies that there was body movement or whatever it is. Uh, so what's the makor? What is the source of shuckling? So many people quote the Pasuk in Tehillim. All of my limbs declare God's greatness. So you, but there's another makor. The Kuzari says something that, you know, you wouldn't believe it. You would dismiss it had the Kuzari not said it. He said... Oh, the minig of shuckling dates from a time when people were very poor and they used to learn from scrolls, like little Megillus, Sefer Torahs. And as a result, uh, you have one scroll for 10 people, so they can't really read it. So every once in a while, so I'm reading, I then move back so you can move forward. You bend down, you move back, I can move forward. <laughs> shuckling was instituted simply because a lot of people had to share. By the way, another thing about that, uh, Taimonim, traditionally, were able to read upside down. They could read Hebrew upside down. And the reason, once again, is they were very poor. So they would have like one safer, and all the kids would be around the table, all four sides of the table. So if the safer is facing me, and you're over there, you're reading it uh, upside down, right? So Taimonim acquired the talent of reading upside down for the same reason. But be it as it may, the reason I'm telling you the story is Rav Moshe Davin's Ramrod Strait. And someone asked him once, you know, the minog of most uh, Yidden is to shuckle. So he says, he used to shuckle. He used to Davin like everybody else. But one time when he was a Rav in Stalinist Russia, uh, and he was teaching Torah, and he was doing activities that he could, he could be killed or exiled to Siberia, which would have been the same as, as death, he was taken in for interrogation by what was then called the NKVD. Later it was the KGB, the secret police. And he said he was so frightened that he was paralyzed. He couldn't move. So then he thought to himself, if the KGB scares him so much that he can't move, how can he have like less year as Hashem than he has for the KGB? So he figured that the appropriate stance of Yira is to be like frozen. So the point I'm making is, so you see that you tr when you do something for B'nai Adam in respect, you apply it to Hashem. So I was thinking if a person would wear a tie at a business meeting, 
he should wear it for Hashem. But al pi halacha, it's not a subjective thing. If the if the if, if the makam allows that type of informality, so it's not going to become a a chiyuv. This is the issue with the hat as well. You know, tie, tie is a big issue, but uh, because uh, even bnei tayra often do not wear a tie, uh, but a hat is an issue, right? Bnei tayra wear a hat typically. Uh, I know the center sometimes is not allowed to for a while, but whatever. I don't know what your rule is these days. Uh, but people question, like, why do you wear a hat? So if you look in the Mishnah Berurah, the official reason is because when you go before a Tsar, when you go before an important official, you come with a hat. Well, the problem is, yeah, maybe that was in the olden days. That's certainly not true today. You know, you don't, I mean, you, you don't go to a business, I mean, unless you're a yeshiva guy, but I mean, but in terms of general etiquette, hats, uh, you know, are not part of it. So. Why would there be a chiyav to wear a hat? So that's because they come up with other reasons. Al pi kabbalah, you have to have two covers, etc. A yamalka and a hat. But the the, the 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 traditional idea that a hat is how you're omed in front of a melech, the is not a very uh, powerful reason. Powerful reason today. So that would be the hetcher. Not, not that it, I'm not saying there is a hetcher, but those that have a hetcher say the hetcher is based on that. But you know, if Chaim Kineski was really, I don't want to say a fanatic, I mean, I can't say it, that, but he was extremely machmer on proper lavush, including a hat, ad kedei kach, that he paskins, that you daven be achidus with your hat instead of davening with dominion without your hat. I mean, let's assume that my hat is upstairs or whatever it is. There's a minion right now. I don't have a hat. So should I daven b'tzibor without a hat? Or... Should I get my hat and have to daven be yechidus, assuming there's no other minion? He paskened. I, I, I tell you the truth, I would not have paskened that way, but, you know, but, but obviously I have to be mevatel myself. He paskened that wearing a hat was more important than tefillah b'tzibar. Hat kadei kach. So he took it very important, but as they say, in Svara there actually is a header that Bismana said it's less uh, important. Yeah. Yeah, uh, let me get, uh, yeah, yeah. Okay. Torah Shabbat al is the will, the will of Hashem. What is Kabbalah, and how can Kabbalah contradict with, with Halacha? Yeah, so, so yeah, Torah Shabbat is the will of Hashem. And then we have something called Kabbalah. Now, Kabbalah literally does not mean mysticism. Kabbalah literally just means tradition. But the word is tradition is used with respect to what we call the mystical tradition of Judaism. So it starts off this way, really. In reality, it's an apples and oranges comparison because Torah Shaval Peh is primarily about halacha. How do you behave? What do you do? What is your behavior? How do you do mitzvahs? Kabbalah is describing how Hashem interacts with the world in all the different ways through the spheros and the like. So on its face, there are really two different bodies of knowledge that are complementary to each other. The Torah is about how I behave, and the Kabbalah is trying to understand, you know, as to whatever degree it's possible for us, how Hashem makes the universe, how Hashem interacts with the universe. So it does also come back all the way back from Moshe, but the Kabbalah added chidushim and new insights, etc. So in theory, there would not be a, there would not be a conflict really, because it's two different things, just like you know. Uh, there should be no conflict between uh, algebra and calculus. They're just two different branches of mathematics. These are two different branches of Torah. But it's not so simple because Kabbalah over time also developed certain instructions for how you should behave. You know, given that God behaves a certain way, you should do certain things to, to create certain reactions. Once you start talking about what you should do, now, potentially, there could be a collision course with the Torah Shabal Peh, where the Gemara says, do one thing, and the Kabbalah says, do the other thing, and, and, and the like. So, there's a famous teaching of the Vilna Gaon. And uh, the Vilna Gaon was both, of course, the great, great master of Halacha, and, but he was also even greater in Kabbalah, even greater in Kabbalah. And he said, there is absolutely no contradiction between Kabbalah and Gemara, uh, and if you think there's a contradiction, you either don't understand the Kabbalah or you don't understand the Gemara. He says there cannot be a contradiction because they're both true, and in truth there will not be a contradiction. 
Now, sometimes it's very hard for us to apply that because there are, con there are contradictions, you know, as far as we see. But the Vilna Gaon t promises us, if you truly, truly understood it, there would not be a contradiction. So all I can tell you is that practically, if there is ever a contradiction between Kabbalah and Halacha, you follow Halacha. Uh, that's the way it works. Uh, and theoretically, the Gras said there will actually not be a contradiction. So it's hard to know. But you're correct. Kabbalah cannot contradict Halacha. Well, but here's the thing. You, you have to understand what we mean by Halacha, meaning like this. I said Kabbalah cannot contradict Gemara. But when you're talking about later things, Rambam, Shulchan Aruch, so the Hasidim take the position that the Arizal, I mean, the Shulchan Aruch is, 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 is a very important Acheron, but an early Acheron. So they say we could follow Kabbalah because we can look at the Kabbalah the way it understood the Halacha, even if the Shulchan Aruch didn't understand the Halacha that way. See, that's a little different. It's not so much contradicting the Halacha, it's contradicting a particular source of Halacha that they would regard their source with more authority. But let's say to contradict something in the Gemara, that they would not do. They would not do that at all because that's kind of definitive Halacha that nobody can argue with. Yeah? <laughs> so, uh, yeah, so the question is if a gadol like Rav Chaim Kenyeski, Zechron Olivracha, which we just had his uh, first yard site, uh, tells you to make a very big change in your life and it's just something you can't handle, like, what's your excuse? What do you do? How do you get out of it? Well, uh, this is indeed uh, something that people are stuck with sometimes. Uh, that's why when you want to have an appointment, when you wanted to have an appointment with Rav Chaim Kenyeski, one of the questions that you would be asked by the intermediary is, are you ready and willing and able to accept whatever he'll tell you? Because if you're not ready, it is better not to ask. Right? No one says you have to ask. I mean, an example was something that for many of us might not be a major issue, but for some people it was. Rav Chaim Kineski was very big that every uh, Ben Torah, even if you're single, should have a beard. This was a big thing of his. Now, today, uh, you know, a lot of yeshiva guys have beards, even if they're single. But, you know, 20, 30, 40 years ago, actually, it was not that common. And even if you look at pictures of Rav Steinman, look at pictures of people who later became gedolim, when they were bacharim in Europe, they actually didn't have beards. Okay? But Rav Chaim Kinevsky, from the Chazanish, you know, that was his uncle, basically was big into beards. So they tell the story. I mean, it sounds like a, a minor story, but apparently it was a very big deal about a guy that had trouble with Shiduchim. He was a Ben Torah and he learned and he even had a profession. So he had money and had Parnassah, but uh, he, he wasn't getting a Shidduch. So he wanted to go to Rav Chaim Kanevsky. What can he do to have a Shidduch? And he was clean shaven. And his whole family was clean shaven. And this was the Messiah in the family, not to have a beard. And Rav Chaim Kanevsky said, grow a beard and you'll get a Shidduch. So the person said, uh, can you give me something else to do? <laughs> I don't want to do that. And Chaim said, no, you got to grow a beard. So I don't know why it was so traumatic, but the person like started crying. And uh, Rav Chaim Kineski said, he said some harsher says, if you don't grow a beard, you're not going to have a shit if you're going to die single. So the, the guy's like crying away, and the, uh, the, the family said to Rav Chaim, like, why, why are you so tough, tough in this guy? You know, you, you see that he can't do it. And Rav Chaim says, I'm not being tough. He just has to grow a beard. <laughs> so I don't know. Apparently, it was a traumatic issue. What makes people traumatized depends from person to person. But the problem is this. Now, once the tzaddik is gozer, you know, you have to try to keep it. But on the other hand, um, if it's not given as a psak, if it's given as an eitza, in fact, often Rav Moshe, other gedolim, Rav Yashif even, they would say, I'm not telling you what to do. I think this is a good idea. When it's said in that way, it's still a good idea to follow them, but you have leeway uh, if you're not ready for it at that point. But when it's given as a psak, you're kind of in trouble. Uh, and Be'ezus Hashem, good things will happen. But that's why, you know, uh, you don't... Uh, I mean, listen, this is the first rule in, in cross-examination of a lawyer, right? A lawyer is taught, never ask a question 
that you don't already know the answer to. Because if you don't know the answer, you have no idea what that person's going to say, and it may blow up your case. This is like law 101. So with Gedolim, it's kind of the same thing. Don't ask the question unless you're willing to live with whatever the answer is. If you're not willing to live with whatever the answer is, better not to ask and just make your own decisions. Yeah? Uh, back to Meister a little bit. Um, is there a minimum amount that someone has to be making or earning or have in their bank account in order to be five in Meister? Or is there anything that comes in automatically? Well, well okay, so, so the, the question is minimum amount. There is no minimum amount, but here, here's the point. You're not chayav in Meister until you make enough money to meet what are called the basic expenses of middle class life. Now that, you need to define that. But let's assume the basic expenses of middle class life, which includes rent, transportation, basic food, you know, more than bread and water. Let's assume, I'll make up a number, it comes up to $15,000 a year. It's, actually it's much more, but let's assume. So that means if I earn 15,000 or less, I don't have to give my share at all. Once I make the break even point, then I give Meister on every dollar. So even if I get 50 cents, I take off 5 cents and give it. So there is no minimum that comes in for Meister as long as you're above the basic, the, you know, middle class standard of, of living. Yeah? Um, when it comes to like reading Aisha in general, like Pasha Pashat without Hazal, I think like the famous example is uh, Reuben and Boaz. But like, a lot of times you find stories that Pasha Pashat are the opposite Yeah, that's right. Asaph does not come across uh, that awful in the Chumash. Yeah, yeah. So the interesting question is this. We have the Chumash, which is Pshat. You know, you just read the story. And then we have the Torah Shabal Peh that interprets and explains and gives us the meaning of the Torah. Now, it's clear if you're a believing Jew, we're, we're Makabel, that what Chazal tell us, which was handed down all the way back, is Emes. And that's fine, right? So uh, we're not going to ask, well, how could Chazal be right if the Psukim say the other way? The answer is that's Torah Shabal Peh. But that does give rise, this is what you're asking, to another question which we often don't ask. And the question we don't ask is this. If the Chumash does not mean what it says, then why did it say it that way? That's a good question that, you know, I, I believe in Torah Shabbat. I believe that what Chazal say is Emes. And I believe that even though the, the, the language of the Pasuk says another thing, it's, it happened the way Chazal say it. But why did it say it? I mean, even in Halachas that way. Ayin tachas ayin. The Torah says, an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. I knock out your tooth, you knock out my tooth. I knock out your eye, you knock out my eye. But we know, Chazal, that's called the Lex Talionis. But we know, Chazal tell us, oh no, that's never what it meant. Knock out an eye, I gotta pay compensation. All of that is good, and of course we believe that. But the question is, so why did the Torah say, Ayin, Tachas Ayin? And the same thing is true with stories and the like. So the emphasis is this. Is there is a mahalach, and it, it's hard to go over without going over a specific example, of really from the Gra, but the Meshachachma especially, Meshachachma is the Arsameach, goes over it by that Pshat itself is intended to communicate something to you. In other words, let's say Ayin Tachas Ayin. Even if halachically you pay money, the Torah is telling you that you deserve that your eye be knocked out, and the money is a way of buying yourself out of it. There is a tachlis in pshat itself. So that would mean in every single story, you try to understand what is the pshat teaching you. Even if it didn't happen that way, but the Torah wrote it that way, so there'd be some musr, some hashkafa, that you can get from the way the story is told. Okay, so you'd have to look at each, each particular instance. Now, of course, uh, you know that uh, this is connected, at least indirectly, with the controversy we spoke about a few weeks ago uh, about a safer that's called 
actually five, five volumes, a whole chumash, called Pshuto Shal Mikra, in which uh, they have a commentary on Rashi, but they also give you Poshit Pshat, based on other Meforshim, and sometimes it's not like Rashi and not like Chazal. And as you know, although I personally have said I think it's a very excellent Sefer, as a matter of fact, but uh, there were groups that put it in Cherem and say you're not allowed to read it, precisely because they felt it was undermining either Rashi or Torah Shabal Peh Bichlal. But uh, the MS says, well, you know, you, the truth is you have Rishainim that specialized in Pshuto Shal Mikra. Uh, you have uh, the Rashbam, Rashi's own grandson. You have the Eben Ezra. You have Rav Yasef Bechor Shor, that's a little less known, but uh, he was a master of Pshat. So clearly the Rishainim felt, even with Tarish Abal Peh, when it's not Nogel the Halacha, we can try to understand the meaning of Pshuto Shal Mikra. So, it's a difficult, a difficult question, but the Meshe Chachma tries to show whenever there's a stira between the pshat and the understanding of Chazal, the Torah is teaching you a lesson in the pshat as well that you have to look at. Yeah. I just have two questions about Yosef and Aisha's uh, Posifar. Yeah. But Aisha's Posifar, how is what, how is her cheshbon different from the cheshbon of Tamar with Yehuda? And secondly, the measure says that Yosef, like before Yosef, he was about to give in, but then Yaakov you know, appeared to him in a vision and said, if you do this, you know, you're going to get wiped out. And you know, he was too scared to do it. So, but why don't we find, similarly, like, do, like did Yitzchak Avinu appear to Esau before he sinned? Did Avram Avinu appear to Yishma before he sinned? Or they, why, were, why were they left out? Yeah, yeah. So let's take the first question first. Uh, you remember that um, Ashes Potiphar, who tried to seduce uh, Yosef, so there are Midrashim that say her kavana was L'shem Shemayim because she saw something very good coming out because Yosef, in fact, married Osnas, the, the daughter, etc. Her kavana was L'shem Shemayim, but uh, she's still considered sinful and the like. And yet we have Yehuda and Tamar, who also, Tamar also saw Malchus based of it, etc. And she is praised as the righteous woman uh, and the like. Uh, both of them are trying to justify their action based on Navua or some future vision. Uh, why is one considered uh, good and righteous and the other is considered to be uh, not good? So I think there actually is a, a push at the difference really. And that is, before Matan Torah, the Ramban writes, the mitzvah of Yibum, to perpetuate the seed of someone who died without kids, was not only a brother, but it applied to uh, all relatives, including a father-in-law. So although Tamar engaged in deceptive behavior, but at the end of the day, her deceptive behavior was to trick Yehuda into doing a mitzvah that he has, was obligated to do. As opposed to uh, uh, Aisha's Potiphar, she was a guy, she was a non-Jew. So uh, the Avos did not want a relationship with non-Jews. That would be connected to Torah later, as it was later given. So in a sense, she was doing an Avera for a higher purpose. Tamar was doing a mitzvah for a higher purpose. So that's going to be a big difference right there. Now, the other thing, your second question, about how come Yaakov appears to Yosef? But, you know, why doesn't uh, Yitzchak appear to Esav or, or, or whatever it is? Well, the short answer is, this is not a magic trick. It's not like whenever you're about to do an Avera, some tzaddik appears to you. It's really a function of your overall personality, meaning Yosef, who was so connected to everything he learned from Yaakov, and Yosef spent his days and his nights thinking about what Yaakov taught him and how he would survive in a contaminated, corrupt environment like Mitzrayim. So at that point, Yaakov will appear to him because Yosef internalized that vision. If he didn't internalize that vision, it's not going to come to you. Meaning, it's not just stam, something that drops down from the sky. It's a function of what you have inside of you. Yosef had it. Yeah, Yishmael and Esav did not have that connection to Ruchnius. Yeah. Yeah, this is actually a very good question. Uh, what is more important? Uh, learning the Hebrew language, because by learning the Hebrew language, you can unlock the svarim, and you can have something to teach your children as well. 
uh, versus spending time learning Gemara or any type of text, which you might do without getting skills in language, etc. I assume when you say Hebrew, you're including Aramaic, meaning uh, you want to learn the language so you can look at texts. Uh, Jewish texts are Hebrew and Aramaic, so I'm, but I'm assuming you meant Aramaic as well. Um, you know, it is a, it is a very, very good, uh, good question uh, because language will give you the key to everything, but you're not necessarily learning a lot of Torah. Like even in Gemara, you have this problem. Uh, when we're teaching you Gemara, right, what are we emphasizing? What should we emphasize? Should we emphasize skill acquisition? Or should we emphasize content acquisition? Now you understand that Gemara is taught very different ways, depending on that. If we're doing skill acquisition, we're going to look at every word, you know, and you're going to memorize word lists and this and that. And maybe you'll do five lines a week uh, because we're going over every word to give you that language acquisition. But there'll be very little knowledge that you're going to have. You're not going to know a lot of Torah. But you're preparing a way that you will be able to spend your life accumulating. Uh, so some people say, it's really, I think it's a machlokas among mechanchim. Some people say, we got to give you the language skills. Without the language skills, uh, nothing's going to happen. Others say, hey, language is language. Okay, now that there's translations and everything else, who cares if you do art scroll or anything else? Uh, the main point is to know as much Torah as you're able to know to have knowledge, to have ideas. Um, it's hard to know what, what is best. I think, number one, it depends on your aptitudes. It depends on what interests you and the like. But I think the only answer, which is really, uh, you know, it's kind of a mushy answer, is you got to try to do both. Now, I know that any one of those goals that you're pursuing will be at the expense of the other goal. They're, they don't really work together because they're two different types of goals. But you have to have time. You have to have ulpan. You have to have language acquisition. You have to have skill, but you have to have content. You can't just spend the, first of all, I think most people go crazy. Uh, if we were to spend the whole day just teaching you language skills, and you're, you know, you're 24, 25, 26, and we're going over, okay, the kamats with an aleph is aw and ba and ga, you know, whatever it is, you're going to go crazy. I mean, you need, uh, as an intellectual, right, or some AF students are, all intellectuals. As intellectuals, you have to have content. We have to give you something interesting to debate and to discuss. So what yeshivas try to do, and maybe because of this, <laughs> we're not fully successful as much as we could be in either of those goals, is that I think the yeshiva tries to do both, both at the same time. And Baruch Hashem, uh, you know, people do accomplish some reasonable success in either of those goals. Yeah. Um, so you said a partial Exactly, like what does all of that come to teach us about like our lives or like in general, like why is there such a big emphasis on, on this? Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, one of the great difficulties people have when they learn Chumash basically is the an amazing, inordinate amount of detail that the Torah gives us about the Mishkan. Uh, every single dimension is repeated, not just once, it's repeated at least three times. Because Hashem gives the command, then Moshe gives the command, and then they carry it out. And every time it goes over. In fact, you'll notice, Parshas Vayakal Pekude, there's very little Rashi. Because Vayakal Pekude is just repeating what God commanded. Rashi already explained that in Truma and Tetzave. So there's Kamat no Rashi in Parshas Vayakal and Pekude. So why does it go over it again and again and again? So if you look in Rabbeinu Bechaya, one of the, the great commentaries, he actually says that there are 613 commandments about parts of the Mishkan. I didn't count it, but he, he makes such a cheshvin. And we know that the number 613 corresponds not only to the mitzvos of the Torah, but to the limbs and sinews of the human body. Right? You know this idea that the 248 positive commandments are my bones, each bone has a positive commandment that gives it life. The 365 negatives are against my sinews and my ligaments. If I violate a negative, at least spiritually, so to speak, my ligament suffers, right? So he says, since the ultimate goal is to make yourself a Mishkan of Hashem, 
This is critical. Hashem says, Asu li mikdash, make for me a holy place, vishachanti betocham, so I will dwell in them, meaning us. So therefore, every single aspect of the 613 commandments of the Mishkan somehow corresponds to my limb, to my sinew, in terms of how I construct a Mishkan for Hashem. The problem is, to understand what this means practically uh, is really in the realm of Kabbalah, because we don't really know how this dimension is connected to this. But let me give you just uh, some short examples, though, where we do have brief hints. The Kli Yokor points out that if you look at the dimensions of the Aron HaKodesh, the Ark, the, the, the holiest part of the Mishkan, you will see that all of the dimensions are in fractions. Two and a half by one and a half by one and a half. Everything is midos shavuros. He says that's a very important lesson because uh, that connotes the sense, number one, of being humble. I'm not complete. I am only partial. Torah only remains with somebody that's humble. And number two, it connotes the idea that you've never completed your learning. A person must always regard themselves as incomplete. There's never a point at which you say, I've graduated. I think I told you the story about Rabbi Eliezer Silver, a great, great rabbi, a great godel, who came to the United States in the 1920s. And legend has it, I'm not sure if it's true, that he lost his first rabbinic position because they thought he was wasting electricity in the shul at night. He was there too late. And when he protested that he's learning, they said, ah, that's even worse. We thought we hired a rabbi who finished school. You're still learning? What type of thing is that? So they fired him because they figured a rabbi is supposed to be finished with that stuff. Right? So you see, obviously, that's not the way we look at things. And uh, therefore, the shavuros connotes humility, and the shavuros connotes the idea that I always have to learn. Now, another thing in the Oren, I'm just giving you some random things here. The Oren had these poles, right? There were rings in the Oren, and the Oren was carried with poles. But when the Oren was at rest, the Torah says, the poles of the Oren cannot be removed. The poles remain with the Oren. It's a low sasa. If you remove the poles from the Oren, you can get Malchus. It mamish is a low sasa. Lo yasuru mimenu. So what's the significance? What does that teach me? The Chavitz Chaim says, ah, the Aaron represents Torah. The Aaron represents the learning of Torah. The Poles support the Aaron. They represent the people who carry the Torah. In other words, the economic supporters, the emotional supporters. So if they carry the Torah to the journey of life, when the Aaron comes to its final rest, which is Olam Haba, the Talmud Chacham, those people who supported Torah will be in Olam Haba in the same way, in Sachar and Zavulet. Right, so this is an example of lessons. Now, the Shulchan, right, the Shulchan is the gold table that had 12 chalos, lechem hapanit, that would be eaten every Shabbos and replaced with new chalos. So the Shulchan, some of the dimensions are whole and some are fractions. It's two by one and a half, and it's, uh, some of it is shleimot, and some of it is shavuros. Says the Kliyakar, if the Aron HaKodesh represents Torah learning, the Shulchan represents Parnasa and Gashmias, because it's bread. So when it comes to Gashmias, you need a combination of whole and part. The whole says you should be happy with what you have. You shouldn't feel that you're missing something. You should be sameach b'chelko. The part indicates you shouldn't indulge your taivas to the maximum. So going through things like that, the point is that on a deeper level, all of these details are designed to teach us something. It's not always easy to tease it out or to figure it out, but that's the, the ultimate idea. Now, the Rambam has a bit of a different perspective, actually. The Rambam actually says that we can't always understand the meaning of detail, meaning we can understand why there's a Mishkan, we can understand why there's things in general, but when you start asking, why is it this dimension, that dimension, the Rambam says we're, we're not able to know that. But others try to find symbolism 
even in the smallest detail. Yeah. Uh, here's another sentence. Assuming that she is dressed sneosly, does the Rav think it is skeptically okay for a girl to go to a mixed gym? Yeah, uh, the question is, is it hashkafically okay? Is it halachically okay? Uh, that's both ways. Uh, for a girl uh, who is dressed properly, that's very important, uh, to go to a mixed uh, gym. No, it's a hard question. It, it really kind of depends on how many people frequent the gym. It depends on the time of day. It depends on whether there are alternatives. Uh, theoretically, for a Tsunua woman to be in a gym doing things that do, do, do not reveal her body is no different. Why would it be different than working in an office where there are men? Just because there are men there too, that doesn't postulate. it. I mean, we allow women to work in offices. We allow women to work in stores. So what is it, what is it about a gym that would be especially problematical? So I think the answer is theoretically it would be OK. But practically, and I don't want to get too explicit, uh, the nature of, of exercising is such that uh, the body gets accentuated and uh, different parts of things get emphasized. So it's not the same as a stationary secretary sitting at a desk or behind a counter. So I, I do think there are some problems of tsnias, even if a woman is properly tsunua. So generally speaking, we would not encourage it, but, but, if, for example, there's a unique health problem, let's say, for example, um, the woman has a, a, a back a slip disc or whatever and needs to exercise with certain machines and there's no other opportunity in terms of time or place uh, that she could do it uh, and uh, she's dressed sanua, so in cases of necessity, uh, it could very well be permitted. And then you try to time it when there aren't like a lot of people there. Like, you know, there's one guy, there's one guy at the other end of the gym and, um, and the girl is here, you know, they're, they're not really looking at each other. That's very different than the situations where you have like, uh, you know, 10, um, what are they called? 10 treadmills, where you have like five men and five men and one girl in the middle there, you know, that that's, tends not to be the best type of environment. Uh, yeah? Uh, yeah. How do we deal with uh, Yibam and how do we, uh, how do we get to the part of giving the mitzvah of Yibam that, that, that Hashem commanded us? Yeah, so for people who are contaminated with Western thought, uh, how do you understand uh, Yibam? Or what? I mean, the truth is I'm not sure why Yibam uh, poses such a problem for you. I mean, I think it's a very beautiful idea in many, many ways. And that is, you know, instead of saying like Kayan, am I my brother's keeper? A Jew says, I am my brother's keeper. Uh, my brother, uh, no, not, I don't want to say my, but a person's brother left the world without children. Yibam says, I step forward. I step forward to try to perpetuate my brother's seed. It's a, a sense of community, a sense of care. Now you do know, I think I mentioned it before, that uh, Ashkenazim no longer practice Yibam. Uh, that today if a man dies without children, even if his brother is single, single, and even if uh, both he and the Yavama want to get married, Betoras Yibam, the Ramah Paskins, Ashkenazim do not do Yibam today, and the woman needs Chalitza instead. And the basis of the Ramah is, Ravaji, is um, Abba Shol, an opinion, an opinion of Abba Shol in the Gemara, that says that since marrying your brother's wife is actually an erva, but it's mutter and a mitzvah of Makam Yibam, that only applies when your kavana is totally for the sake of heaven. And since our kavana is not l'shem shemayim, it's ki'ilu, it's an erva. So we actually don't do yibam today. Uh, Svardim, I think I mentioned a few years ago, uh, are permitted to do yibam. But in 1948, the Svardic chief rabbi, Rav Uziel, entered into an agreement with Rav Herzog to make uniformity that Svardim would stop doing yibam. Uh, that's about 1948. Rav Ovadja held, when he became the Sephardic Rav Rashi in the 1970s, that Rav Uziel didn't have the right to be Mavater on the Menhagim of Sephardim. And he said, for sure, Sephardim can do, can do Yibam. So I'm not sure what, if they do it or they don't do it. Now, technically, Rav Vajra also held they could do polygamy, but that they really can't do because it's against Israeli law. The police can arrest a person. So... That much he didn't go, but but Yibam, Yibam is not against the law, uh, so Yibam. 
so, uh, so again, I don't have such a problem. I mean, the reason why a Western person might have a problem is that Western culture as it's developed, not the way it originally was necessarily, is extremely individualistic, that you no longer have a sense of responsibilities to your community, you no longer have a sense of responsibility to your family, everything is about looking after number one, everything is about my hedonism, my gratification, and each person pursues what they care about. So the notion of yibum is abhorrent, uh, possibly. Why do I have to care about my brother, etc.? But uh, Judaism proceeds on a very different, different premise, that I am my brother's uh, gate uh, watcher, and I have to try to do something good for him. Yeah. Um, so I, I, heard, I heard that the mitzvah of Puravu is completed only once somebody has a boy and a girl at some point. So first of all, where does that idea come from? And secondly, if that is in fact the case, why would a mitzvah be based on seemingly chance, right? You have 50% chance each time. But I, I mean, I even know some people who have seven girls, you know? Yeah. So did they just <laughs> get unlucky and they don't have the mitzvah? Now, you know, there is, there is a Maimur mm Chazal -hmm. uh, that says, if you have seven boys in a row, uh, you, you're guaranteed olam haba, but because having seven boys is uh, quite a quite a struggle. <laughs> Apparently, seven girls isn't so bad, isn't so hard as as seven boys. But okay, uh, the statement that you don't fulfill pru or vu until you have a son and daughter is in the Mishnah itself, Mishnah It is a machlokas beis shamai and beis hillel. Beis shamai says two sons or two daughters would be good enough. Basilo says it has to be a son and a daughter, and it, as is always the case, in a machlokes Beishamay and Basilel, we paskin like Basilel. So the Shulchan Aruch, in fact, says you're not Makayim Pru or Vu until you have a son and a daughter. Now, your question is a very good question. Gee, uh, whether I have a son or a daughter, or children at all for that matter, is not up to me, it's up to Hashem. So, how can we say? that if I have you know, 10 sons, whatever it is, I keep on trying and trying and trying, I don't get a daughter, that somehow I didn't do that mitzvah, I wasn't mashlam my neshama. So I'll tell you uh, my own Rebbe's explanation of it, I think which is a very, very, very logical explanation, although I think the Mincha Schinech does not agree with it. My Rebbe is Rev uh, Yaakov Moshe Kolevsky, Zechwan Levracha. Uh, there's even an art scroll biography of him you can, you can, you can get. Wonderful, wonderful uh, Rebbe. In fact, all sorts of stories. Um, he was in the army in World War II. He was learning in Torah Vedas, and he got drafted in World War II. How did he get drafted? I mean, th there was an exemption for rabbinical students. So here was the thing. The army had selected service. The draft came to interview people if they were learning in yeshiva and the like. And the, the boys were instructed to say, if they ask you, what are you doing here? I am studying to be a rabbi because that's the basis for the exemption. You have to be studying to be a priest, studying to be a rabbi. Rev Klesky did not want to say he was studying to be a rabbi because he said, I'm not studying to be a rabbi, I'm studying because Hashem wants me to learn Torah. So when, they asked, when the government official asked him, uh, why, are you, why are you here, he says, um, I believe that God wants me to read these books and think about these books and study these books. Well, that's not a good enough reason to get out of the draft. You have to be saying you want to be a rabbi. So <laughs> he shouldn't have said what he said, but he said it because of Torah Lishma. He got drafted. Uh, Baruch Hashem, he was not shipped overseas. And he even got made a deal that every Shabbos he would be allowed to go to yeshiva from the army base on the condition that he wears his army uniform. So every Shabbos he would go to Torah Vadas and he'd be wearing an army uniform. That's how he had to daven. It was a condition, but he was able to get released for Shabbos the, because he was posted in Brooklyn. So it actually was how he got married. What happened was that he was in a swarm store uh, with a military uniform, and he was reading a Ketso Sachoshin. He's reading a Ketso So the owner of the swarm store figured this guy's looking, at most he's looking for a sitter or a bencher or something. He says, you don't want, you don't really, you don't really don't want this book. I'll show you where the, uh, where the benchers are or something. <laughs> and uh, it turned out that, no, he really was reading a Tzosa Choshen, like I tell you, he was a, a Lamdin. So the Svarim owner was so impressed by this young man 
that uh, he wanted a shidduch with his daughter, and that became uh, the Rebetzin, Rebetzin Kolevsky. Uh, anyway, but, uh, but his, okay, that was just a, you know, Zecher Tzadik Levracha, when you mention a tzadik, you should say something about him uh, to remember. Uh, but he said the following, he said like this, the mitzvah of Pruervu is not to have children. How can there be a mitzvah to have children? It's a mitzvah to be mishtadel in having children. So the question is, how long do you have to be mishtadel? He says, you have to be mishtadel until you have a son and a daughter. Which means it's not the pshat, you don't have a mitzvah until you have a son and a daughter. You have a mitzvah. In fact, according to this, you may even have a mitzvah if you have no children at all, if you're mishtadel to have children. But you're not exempt from continuing the ishtadlus till you have a son and daughter. So a son and daughter is not the definition of fulfilling a mitzvah. Son and daughter is the definition of when you are potter from continuing your heart. That, that is mamash a geval It makes a lot of sense because otherwise you're, you're, you're given a mitzvah that, that you, know, you have no way of, of doing. But uh, again, I'll say again that if you look at the Michas Chinuch, uh, he clearly does not go with that mahalach, but, but still, uh, this is what my Rebbe said. So I think at least that would answer your, your question. Yeah? Some sins are, cl are clearly bad to everyone with a normal sense of humor. I'm sorry, start, start again, start the sentence again. Some sins yeah. are clearly bad to everyone with a normal sense of morality. Yeah. Murder, stealing, and rape. But two of the cardinal sins, at least to me, seem to be less obviously evil than sins which are considered less a sin, but involve causing tremendous pain. So what is so absolutely evil about idolatry and adultery that they are considered worse than rape or other clearly evil sins? Right, right. So the question is that we have uh, the cardinal sins of Judaism, the worst sins of Judaism, that you have to give up your life. Uh, one of them is murder. Murder, you're saying, is, well, that's pretty understood. Every normal person understands that murder is an awful, awful thing. Uh, but some of the others are hard to understand uh, from a moral perspective. What is so abhorrent uh, to idolatry? And the other was something like adultery. So let's take them separately. The reason why, I, now it's true that idolatry may not be a moral offense per se. You know, whether you're an atheist or an idol worshiper, you might still be a nice guy and a moral guy and, uh, you know, you treat your... Uh, you know, your uh, staff nicely and you feed your dog and cat every night. But I, I think it's fairly simple that uh, idolatry creates a life without God, without a supreme belief in God. And without God, all morality will eventually break down. Meaning people do ask the question, isn't it, why, why, why do we need God? Why do I need ceremonies? Isn't it enough to be a good person? Well, I think the answer that was given to that was by Dostoevsky, because he was talking about Christianity, but he once said, he has, I think, in, the, in Crime and Punishment, he has uh, Raskolnikov, or maybe, or maybe it's from Brothers Karamazov, I don't remember, but a statement, a very famous statement, without God, all things are permitted. And this is a real hard question, meaning, without God, why should I be moral? Now, I'm not suggesting every atheist is immoral. Many atheists are probably, most atheists, most of the time, or thank you, most atheists are probably okay people. But when push comes to shove and you're under stress and you really need something, I need your coat or I, you know, I, whatever it is, what's going to stop me unless I believe in some higher authority? So the problem of idolatry is the denial of a supreme God that creates morality. So even though you might argue that idolatry itself uh, is not immoral, but idolatry itself is a foundation that will lead to immorality. Now, the question of adultery, well, listen, uh, once again, in a Western society of freedom, people look at adultery as uh, a consensual thing. If everybody's happy, meaning husband gives permission to wife and wife gives permission to husband, and they have what are called open marriages, or menage a trois, whatever it would be, all sorts of different stuff that people do. It's a victimless crime, right? What's wrong with victimless crimes? But I think, once again, the answer is that the Torah understands that marriage and the faithfulness and the commitment of husband and wife 
is the building block of a society. It's a way of creating healthy children. It's a way of perpetuating moral values. And when you have a society in which marriage and the commitments of marriage are no longer that important, you've introduced a cancer and a rot into society that will ultimately undermine everything. And indeed, what can I tell you? Uh, we see it this very day. Uh, we do live in it. I don't mean Israel in particular, but Western society has evolved in a situation where marriage is no longer sacrosanct. Uh, even gender identity is no longer self-evident. And as a result, there's a tremendous breakdown in every single aspect of, of morality. Uh, and uh, without marriage, everything goes. So uh, my point basically is that you can't just analyze it in terms of itself. Is it a moral offense? You have to look at what types of cracks, fissure cracks, is this going to be generating in the course of time? Yeah. Um, we show why you're the be uh, best version of, of ourselves that Shem wants us to be, that Shem wants us to be. How do we know what that version of ourselves that Shem wants us to be? <laughs> yeah, so uh, we're supposed to be the best version that we can be. How do we know what version that's supposed to be? Right? We don't have a, an app store or whatever it is that has all the different, all the different versions. You know, the short answer is you don't, really. And that's part of the mystery of life in which there is kind of a trial and error. Now, the good news is that God gave you a real good handicap by giving you a framework of Torah and mitzvahs. He kind of already brought you 70% of the way you got to be. But it's only 70, I mean, I'm making up a number. In other words, Torah and mitzvahs give me the foundation by which I can construct my ideal self. And that's really tremendous. If we wouldn't have that, and we would be starting from ground zero, how on earth would I ever figure anything out? So Baruch Hashem, Hashem gave us a real, real good head start. But the thing that I think even from people sometimes miss is it's a head start, but it's not the end of the game. God puts you on the 50-yard line or whatever it would be, but you've got to get the other 50 yards. And that means looking at your individual talents, looking at the things that God enables you to do, and what are you good at, and who do you, you know. And that requires kind of looking at your life, trying different things, seeing what clicks, what works, what doesn't work. People think that the life of a religious Jew is conformity and sameness. All of us kind of have to be the same and do the same thing and the like. But not really, or at least that's a partial truth. It's not a complete truth. Yeah, we are the same that we have mitzvot and Torah learning, and that's our common foundation. But then we got to also develop our differences, our uniquenesses. And that's a difficult task. Sometimes, you know, you don't know for a while. I like to think about Moshe Rabbeinu, you know. Moshe Rabbeinu had a whole life before he took the Jews out of Egypt. He was 80 years old at the time of Yitzhiyas Mitzrayim. And he had a whole life in Mitzrayim, being raised as a prince, and then in Yisro's house. And the Medrash gives us a whole bunch of things about Moshe that aren't even in the Chumash. He was a king in Africa for many years. So he was a king, and, and he was in jail, and, and, and all sorts of things, that a lot of which the Torah doesn't even bother telling you. So now he's 80. He had a very eventful life. So you figure when you're 80, it's time to go to Florida. You know, I'm going to retire. You know, I worked hard all my life. He was a king in Africa for 40 years. We, 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 know, we know nothing about that time. But he was Mamish a king down there. So 80 years old, you know, time to retire. What's the big deal? And yet, and yet, the very purpose of his life didn't come to him until he was 80. I think there's a lesson there. The lesson is, you never know what your mission is. Your mission may come a little late in life because you needed all those years for preparation, you see? So you gotta be open to what Hashem puts in your life. There could be a lot of surprises, you know? So I wish I had the answer. You know, the Vilna Gaon says a fascinating thing in Mishle. The Vilna Gaon says, at a time when there was prophecy, which we don't have today, you know, we're used to the prophet giving national messages, you know, to the Jewish people. 
That's what in Tanakh. But he said, prophets also used to counsel individuals. You could go to a prophet. This is amazing. You could ask the prophet, what's my goal in life? What's my mission in life? And the prophet would tell you what your mission in life was. That made life a lot easier. Today, we don't have prophets, so we have to try to figure it out. And that's always going to be a little bit hard. Yeah. Um, so, just like an example, um, there's a guy, let's say his name is Ruben, and Ruben's best friend decide, um, ends up mar marrying the Goy. What do I tell Ruben? Like, how do I tell him not to attend like, the wedding? Like, how do you kind of to give that message to someone? Because at the end of the day, they don't believe in it. So they think, oh, that's what I'm going out of respect. But it, like, you shouldn't go, that's the answer. But how do you tell someone that? Because it's, it's just it's a thing that always comes up. Yeah, yeah. So the, so the easiest thing is, you know, be out of the country or something. You know, just, sorry, can't make it. I'm going to Russia or something. But, uh, but uh, I, 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 How do I yeah. tell Ruben? To, yeah. Like, not go to that way, to like, not go. Because he's going out of respect for his friend. Oh, I'm sorry, the other way around. In other words, it's not you not going. I mean, Ruben is a friend of yours yeah. who wants to go to somebody else's non-religious wedding. Friend. Yeah. I see. So you want to talk not to the guy who's getting married, but to the friend of the guy that's getting married. Bad. Ah, okay. That's interesting. You know, um, I'm not sure if there's any good line there, because uh, you, if you tell the person, well, you know, Intermarriage is a real bad uh, sin, and when you go to an intermarriage, you're supporting it, and you're not supposed to lend support. I mean, if the guy himself doesn't think intermarriage is a bad thing. Like he does. But like, oh, he does. Like he's okay. Going out of support for his best friend. Like, okay. So, again, there's not a magic answer if he's not really religious or devout, but I think you can basically say, listen, I know that this person is someone you care about a lot, and I hope you'll stay friends with him. You know? uh, but, you know, when you go to an intermarriage, you're essentially going to a, uh, almost a, a Jewish uh, assassination, meaning to say uh, he's marrying a woman who's not Jewish. Their children are not going to be Jewish. So a chain that lasted for 5,000 years through crusades and holocaust is going to be severed, meaning he's the last Jew in the line. So a, a Jew who feels for his people does not participate in something that's a betrayal of the Jewish people. But, you know, you have to be realistic. Is this going to convince him? My guess is not, but I, I don't want to tell you to abandon the, the, the quest. But, you know, you do what you can. Uh, now, with respect to, let's say, your friend is intermarrying, how do you tell him you're not going to the wedding? So that I think you would just say that these are very deep beliefs that I have that I just can't participate, but, you know, I still care about you and the like, you know. But, but in terms of convincing somebody else, that's going to be a little. That's going to be a little difficult. Yeah. Um, so I, I don't remember exactly where it says this, but uh, the Torah tells us that um, when uh, a man is found to have raped or or somehow you know seduced a woman, um, he has a mitzvah thereafter. We have a mitzvah thereafter for him to marry that woman. Um, yeah. And and. You know, chances are, and certainly in our society today, we would probably think by just what seems, you know, palatable to us to keep this guy away from her at all <laughs> costs. It would seem to be a very ugly thing to have him marry her. How do we understand that the Torah wants, it wants to make it a mitzvah to have him marry her? Yep, yep. So this is uh, indeed a very, very difficult commandment to understand to, from modern perspective. The Torah says... If, I'm just repeating, if a man rapes a woman, so the Torah says there is a mitzvah upon him to marry her, but I hasten to add, only if she wants. That, that's very important to know. If she does not want to marry him, then no. But if she wants to marry him, there is a mitzvah on him to marry her, and not only is there a mitzvah on him to marry her, he is not allowed to divorce her. He is stuck with her, so to speak, or the rest of their life. Again, if she wants a divorce, he could do it, but if she wants... Now, now, the question becomes, to marry, for a woman to marry her rapist seems like the strangest, most bizarre thing that one could possibly imagine. The rapist is an object of revulsion, of hatred. How could she possibly want to marry the guy that violated her? 
It is a very good question. And again, I want to emphasize that if she says no, it's not going to go through. But the question is, why would she ever say yes? So the truth of the matter is, in some ways, uh, rape was viewed from a different perspective. And that is, rape was viewed as an assault. In fact, one can even ask, I mean, I, although I, I don't want to get into something that I may be criticized. You know, rape is elevated in modern consciousness to like the crime of crimes. You know, in states that have capital punishment, they'll often say, for murder or rape. Like, rape is like the worst possible thing. The question becomes, why is that so? You know, rape is real bad, but I mean, for example, if I cut off your hand, I cut off your arm, I don't get the electric chair. For rape, I might. Why would rape be worse than cutting off somebody's hand? It's not so simple. In the eyes of halacha, rape is a form of aggravated assault. It does not have a mystical connotation of the violation of the person. When a woman was raped, she was considered by other men, by men, as kind of damaged goods. Now that's unfair, but that's the way people perceived it. So a rape victim would have had difficulty getting married. So the Torah's attitude was very practical. You broke it, you keep it. Meaning, you stopped her from getting married, you have to take responsibility. Now again, if she doesn't want this, if she is revolted by the guy, then she's not going to be forced. But if it's something that she feels would give her a home, you know, so I, I can't automatically reconcile this with, with 21st century mentality. But I'm just trying to describe the mindset of how that, how that worked. It actually is for the woman's benefit, because she would not be able, in many cases, to be able to get married. Yeah? So um, the Rav has spoken in, in many um, forums that there's this idea that each limb and each sinew in the body is connected to a mitzvah of the Torah. And we know, however, and I know obviously it could also be understood that it's not literally the limb, but rather the spiritual um, part of the limb. However, do we do know that for the root bone, one of the bones that we have in the back of our neck, or somewhere else in your body, that it only gets hana from Moshe Shabbos? Eleven So, in that, in that, in that, in that sense, how would, how are we able to, so to speak, spiritually give hana to our that bone in our body? Yeah, uh, yeah. So that's the question. The question is, we have two hundred and forty-eight bones, and each mitzvah gives nourishment to a particular bone. Now, one of those 248 bones is the Luz bone, which is either the first vertebrae or the last vertebrae. Uh, but L'chaira, uh, so there is an old tradition that Chazal bring that the Luz gets its nourishment from Malava Malka, which is why it's so important. And Luz is the one bone that does not disintegrate. And Tachia Samesim comes from the Luz bone. But the question is, uh, how can you say, if I understand your question, how can you say that it only gets its nourishment from Lava Malka? Apparently there must be some mitzvah saseh that's supposed to nourish it. But Lava Malka is the only one, so the nourishment of that mitzvah doesn't, uh, doesn't come in. Um, that's a good question. It's a good question. Perhaps the way it works is that Lava Malka opens it up to, be, uh, to, to get nutrition, from, meaning the Luz is blocked. Malava Malka opens up the channel, so then the light of whatever mitzvah, I don't know what it is, whatever mitzvah is connected to it can then go in. It's like it opens up an artery or something like that. So maybe that, that's how it works. So it actually does get its nu nutrition from another mitzvah, but you need Malava Malka to open it up. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So this is uh, actually a very important question. Uh, the issue of uh, vacations or uh, trips. Uh, now, obviously, one thing I, is obvious, I'll just say it. Uh, you know, the laws of kashras apply no matter where you are, and the laws of Shabbos apply no matter where you are. So there's no heter whatsoever 
to violate uh, any aspect of Shabbos. But the big question is davening b'tzibur, because that's the big question. Meaning, yeah, I'm going to keep kosher and I'm going to keep Shabbos in a tent or whatever it is, but Lamaisa, there's not going to be a minion. Right, so I'm going to miss uh, davening b'tzibor three times a day, every day. I'm going to miss Kriya Satora Monday and Thursday. And what's even worse is that uh, even on Shabbos, I'm going to miss. So that's really the big question. Again, I, I want to repeat this. There is no leniency at all for Shabbos and kosher and nida, right? You've got to figure out what to do. But minion is the one problem that's insoluble. Uh, in, depending on where you go, because in many places there's not going to be a minion. So that's the question. Am I allowed to go on trips for pleasure? I don't mean for business or necessity. Am I allowed to go on pleasure trips if I'm going to miss tefillah b'tzibor? Uh, so all I can say is you try to avoid it, but al din. Uh, it is mutter if it's something you really need. Now, this is a very subjective element. But if a person needs to get away, because otherwise they're going to get run down, they're going to get agitated, they're going to get depressed. So halacha recognizes the need for a getaway. But uh, the question then becomes how long? You go for a week, you go for two weeks, right? You want to go for six months, you want to go for a year, you want to go for ten years. You know, at some point you have to be mashayar that you're mechayif to connect to a Jewish community. Now, there are people, uh, from people, uh, they actually, uh, they live in uh, these mobile homes and they just drive around all the, in the United States. They drive around all over the place. They're never in a community more than a week at a time. But they make cheshbonos that they try to be in a community at least for Shabbos so they can go to shul. So if you're creative enough and you have the time and energy to invest in this, see, I never go on vacation because I don't have the energy to do research on this. I have too many other things. But if you do research on this, you usually will be able, at least on Shabbos, to have a place that you can do. And uh, if you care about your Avodah Hashem, you will try to at least have a minion for Shabbos. But al din, you are allowed to miss a certain amount of tefillah b'tzibor if you need it for your uh, emotional well-being. Okay? Yeah. Yeah. Is there a specific reason why by Siam we compare ourselves to them? Yes, yes. Uh, this is a Siam, right? We work, we toil, and they toil. We toil, and we get reward. They toil, they don't get reward. Uh, so there's a famous, famous word from the Chafetz Chaim, and the Chafetz Chaim asked, what does it even mean they don't get reward? Uh, a person goes to work, he gets reward. So the Chafetz Chaim says the following. We get rewarded for our work, even if I don't remember the Mesechas, even if I don't, didn't accomplish that much. If I put in the effort, I get reward. In every other endeavor, they get rewarded for results. But if they worked and didn't put the result, they get nothing. So I think what we want to emphasize at a Siyam, Badafka, is that the most important part of the seum is the work and the toil that you put in. Otherwise, a person might feel bad. I finished a masechta, I don't really remember it. Now, you should try to fix that. But So a person might figure, what was the purpose of my learning if I don't really know everything? And the answer is, you still put in amelus. Anu amelim, umekablim sechar. That's what the Chavit Chaim says. Yeah. Um, so this is really a two-part question. Um, firstly, how do we understand real, true love? How do we understand that, that what that is? Um, and, and how do we identify and understand, I mean, quote unquote, fake love or, or what the world might refer to as love? And the second part of the question is, how, how, does, how do we tell a person who, who, who feels that for somebody, for example, you know, if you have a, a non-Jewish man who wants to marry a non-Jewish girl, he feels a, a, a strong, strong, powerful, some sort of emotion, and that's kind of why I'm asking, what is that? What is that? Is that fake yeah. love? How do we understand real love? Yeah. How do we tell him how to deal with what, what is that that he's feeling, and how do we tell him how to deal with that? Because he's feeling something strong, real. And, and yeah, yeah, yeah. So those are really uh, two different questions. In other words, question number one is, what is real love versus fake love? And that may be sometimes difficult, but at least definitionally it's not so difficult. And that is, true love is selfless. True love is caring about the other, rather than using the other as a tool for my self-gratification. 
Uh, they have a famous story about a yeshiva boy who was in a dining room and he was eating fish with a lot of gusto, just eating the fish. So the rabbi asked him, why, why are you eating fish? He says, I love fish. He says, oh, you love fish? That's why you're chewing it and spitting out the bones? If you love the fish, you'd put it in an aquarium. Uh, you don't really love fish, you love yourself, and you're using the fish to feed you. And that's kind of a metaphor for what we mean by fake love, as it were. So real love is selfless. Real love basically says, I care about you even more than I care about myself, and I want to do everything <coughs> to make you happy and take care of you and, and care about you. Now, <coughs> your question is, okay, can a Jewish person have that feeling to, towards a guy? What if, God forbid, a Jewish guy meets uh, a non-Jewish woman and feels that way? He says, she's a wonderful person. I, I see her character. It's so good. Her midos are so, I don't know if I'll use the word midos, but you know, her nature is wonderful. She's lived, and I want to spend my life with her. And you can't really, you know, you can't give simplistic answers sometimes. People might say, oh, it's not real love, it's only an illusion, it's only gratification. Sometimes that's the case. But sometimes it's not the case. I mean, that's the problem. Some of the, like, automatic answers we're going to give are not always going to be real because it seems that there is something here that seems like real, real love. So what do you do? What do you do in a case like that? Well, whether you'll be able to persuade the guy or not is, a, is another question, but the basic idea is, is love the only thing you need for a relationship? Meaning, I'm not denying that the love is there, but it's a love without shared values. It's a love without commitments towards a common vision. And basically, in fact, there, there are even books in the marriage uh, counseling industry called When Love is Not Enough. And that's an issue. Sometimes marriages break up. Uh, they'll actually say, I love this person. I can't live with them. There is such a phenomenon like that. So it's a, real, it's a tragedy in many ways. It's a painful thing that you can have a deep love for someone that is not the person Hashem wants you to spend your life with. You know? So why did God give you that feeling? Well, sometimes it means they have an aspect of their Jewish soul that maybe they will eventually convert. I mean, sometimes what you love about them is the neshama that has a shaykhus, a connection to Yidin. So that might be part of it. Other times there are mysteries you don't really know. But I think my short answer is being in love is not the only thing you need for a relationship. And we have to understand that love has to be joined with a value system. Otherwise it just disintegrates. Yeah. Can the Rav please explain the Mashiach's Raya that the Rebbe is Mashiach and the Raya against that view and the Rambam that is most commonly used against that view what is, what is the authority of that uh, Raya or of that Rambam and on a deeper level it seems like there's something deeper going on you know, just the Chabanik saying he's Mashiach and then, and then that and that is there some like Secrets that you can reveal about. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, my, my sources in Chabad. Yeah. <laughs> well, you know, again, uh, this is something I, I, can, I can tell you this. I can tell you that um, Chabad is very, very interested whenever I or really anybody who's not Chabad comments on this. So it, this is something that does invite negative criticism. Uh, first, I, so I want to make it very, very clear that I have a tremendous kavod and Derek Harris in admiration for Lubavitcher Rebbe. Uh, he truly was a, a guy in Tyra and a, a tzaddik and a person who had an unbelievable influence on not just Chabad, but on virtually all of the Jewish people. Very unusual, unusually great as a manig, number one. And number two, I want to express my admiration for Chabad. You know, anywhere you go in the world, they are there along with Coca-Cola. That's the Coca-Cola and Chabad are every place in the world. And uh, their mesiris nefesh and their devotion is tremendous. So I am not coming from a place of uh, criticism or denigration. I have a tremendous, tremendous respect. And as the saying goes, some of my best friends are Chabad. You know, so. <laughs> <laughs> right. so I don't have a, a problem with that at all. Now, the issue of the Mashiach is, is, is a painful issue. Uh, the Rambam in Hilchus Malachim lists a number of, of characteristics descended from David HaMelech, which the Rebbe was. He fights the wars of God. Now, there already, the Rebbe was not in the armies, but they have to reinterpret it to mean 
he stands up to fight the causes of Torah. Okay, you well, could do that. Uh, so bringing Jews back to Torah. So some of the criteria were met, but the Rambam seems to suggest that Bar Kochba, which Rabbi Akiva thought was Mashiach, could not be Mashiach because he was killed. Uh, and therefore, if the Mashiach is killed, that shows he's not the Mashiach. So Chabad's argument is, killed is not the same as died. <laughs> Bar Kochba was killed. Uh, Mashiach cannot be killed. But Mashiach will die when Mashiach comes, so we, so we believe in a second coming. And the fact that people say, well, if you believe in a second coming of Mashiach, then you're adopting a Christian belief that says the same thing about Yashka. But the answer is, so what? They just have the wrong person. Meaning, just because Christians say there's a second coming doesn't mean that Jews cannot say there's a second coming if you have the right person. So a lot of the contention is exactly on this issue. Can someone be Mashiach if they die before completing their mission? Now clearly the Rebbe did not complete the mission of Mashiach because completion of the mission of Mashiach is bringing all the Jewish people back to Eretz Yisrael and building the Beis HaMikdash. So the Rebbe did not fulfill the Messianic job, but the question becomes, can that be done in the second act? And that depends on what the Rambam means when he says Bar Kochba was Narag uh, because of the sins of the generation and therefore could not be Mashiach. So the truth is there's a lively debate. I will tell you this, very interestingly enough, when the Rebbe was alive before his stroke, I, I, I remember this, Mamash, so when people were talking, the Rebbe is Mashiach, or might be Mashiach, so people asked the question, well, why the Lubavitcher Rebbe? Why not David Amalek? Why not, you know, earlier generations? So they said, then, oh, Mashiach cannot come back from the dead. So if he's dead, he's not Mashiach, so it has to be the Rebbe who's alive. This was the standard answer. When the Rebbe died, somehow, I don't know, Chabad, they must have a very efficient Seamus gathering service, somehow, they gathered all of those books that said Moshiach cannot come back from the dead and they produced a new literature that says, yes, he can. So Chabad itself changed its position on this issue. So that's really the, the, the long and short of it. Uh, now, the thing is this, I do want to say one thing, which, again, this gets criticized on both sides. Some people say, if you believe that the Rebbe uh, is Mashiach and will come back from the dead, that's apikorsis, that's kafira, that's heresy. I would say, no, it's not. Uh, it is a permissible belief. The most you can say is it's a mistake that many Rishayim reject, but it's not apikorsis. So one cannot say this is heretical. Now I say, this gets criticized, I'll tell you, this, this gets criticized on both sides of the equation because uh, the anti-Chabad people say, how can you say it's not apikorsis? It's for sure apikorsis. Chabad says, oh, all you're telling me is that it's not apikorsis, but it's not true. Well, we don't like that either because it is true. So, like the Katsuka Rebbe said, when you walk in the middle of the road, you get hit with traffic coming from both sides. I'm kind of articulating a middle of the road position that it is a permissible belief, but most Rishayim did not accept it as a true belief, but some Rishayim did, the Barbanel, for example. So as a result, I think it's a subject of legitimate discussion. Now, people raise all sorts of things about Shabzai Tzvi and how bad false Mashiachs were. Okay, it's true. There is a history of false Mashiachs being very destructive. But if you look at the Rebbe, everything the Rebbe called for, Torah, mitzvahs, learning, kirov, I mean, everything's good. The agenda is good, meaning this is not leading Klal Yisrael into bad or destructive places. I think it's leading Klal Yisrael into good places. The only bad thing about it is the machlokas that's being generated, but on the other hand, you know, Chabad and the other side are equal in that, meaning I'm not going to say Chabad created machlokas. No, Klal Yisrael created machlokas about this position of Chabad. But if anybody, you know, when the Rebbe was alive, and there was the first announcement about the Rebbe being Mashiach. So somebody ran to Moshe Feinstein and said, 
Rebbe, you got to stop this. They announced the Bible is your Rebbe's Mashiach. And Rabbi Moshe Feinstein said, so what's so bad about that? What's so bad? Why not? Why not? So once he's dead, it's a different issue. But you know, every generation has to have a Mashiach, right? In other words, if Mashiach, think about this. If Mashiach could come every day, Mashiach can come tomorrow. Now, if Mashiach comes tomorrow, there is somebody in the world that is supposed to be Mashiach. Right? So, when the Rebbe was alive, why couldn't he be Mashiach? I mean, he fits a lot of, you know. Uh, you know, I would be relatively confident, you know, I'm not going to think, well, maybe I'm Mashiach or you or whatever it is. I, well, I don't want to say anything about anyone else. You know, most of us, I think, are pretty confident we're not Mashiach. But some people, you know, they're in the running. <laughs> so people say, why didn't the Rebbe announce it that he wasn't? My speculation is, he didn't know. He said, well, you know, maybe I have to wait for a sign. By the way, I was very happy, very excited. I, I have been saying this for many years. This was my hypothesis. I saw a little uh, YouTube thing with uh, Rabbi Groner, Zichron Levracha, who was the Rebbe's secretary for many years. And he said, he once had a conversation with the Rebbe. He says, uh, they say you're Mashiach. The Rebbe said, I have not received a sign min shemayim. I, it's mamish what I, what I said. Now there's, he doesn't know. So that's what's going on, right? So it's hard when you're a Rebbe and you might be Mashiach and you don't know. So you can't, you can't say you are and you can't say you're not. So like Rav Moshe said, if the Rebbe would be Mashiach, he would be a wonderful Mashiach. You know, he's good for the job. But as I say, once he's dead, there are issues. But even, though, even those issues do not arise to the level of Apikorsus or Kefira. Okay? Um, all right. Um, yeah, any, uh, one more question? Are we finished? Uh, yeah. What's the most important thing for a person to do to have a healthy, happy uh, marriage? Yeah, what's the most important thing for a person to do to have a healthy, happy marriage? Wow, that, that's a very hard, hard question. Uh, but I would say be tolerant and accepting. Try to be easygoing. Uh, don't get upset over things. And the more easygoing nature you can be, the happier your marriage. Tension is a, you know, some people are naturally tense. You can't always stop it. But tension is kind of something that can really interfere with shalom bias. So you try to be calm. You try to be happy. You try to be positive and upbeat. And then when things go wrong, etc., you can take it with a sense of humor and it's not going to break you. And then you have, Baruch Hashem, uh, a lot of success in that way. Okay, you'll be well taken care of.